Welcome to the Fighting on Film podcast, the podcast all about classic and obscure war movies, from the Normandy landings to the days of chivalry and swords. If it's been captured on film, we're going to try and cover it. I'm Robbie of RM Military History. I'm Matthew Moss of Historical Firearms and the Armourer's Bench. Hello, welcome back to Fighting on Film. Now, we've just about brushed the popcorn off of our off of our jackets and our coats after we went and saw Napoleon at the weekend. And of course, the film has been mired in controversy ever since it's been released. Some reviews have been good. Some reviews have been bad. Um, the historical uh, community is a little bit up in arms. There's some major controversies going around about certain things in the movie. Uh, scoped by Baker, Baker Rifle et al., um, but this uh, episode of Fighting on Film is going to be a little different to uh, what we what we usually put out for you guys. And we've managed to secure two interviews with the film's uh, historical advisors and military advisors. Um, so I interviewed Paul Biddis, who was the film's military advisor. And Matt, you interviewed. I interviewed uh, Laura Chevalier, who was the, uh, the historical advisor on the film. And we spoke for over an hour. So what we think we're going to do is we are going to pepper this episode with two segments from those interviews with Paul and Larice. And what we'll do is we'll put out both of their interviews combined in full uh, in a special episode on Friday. Um, So you can hear the complete interview. I talked about all sorts of different things. Rob talked about all sorts of different things with Paul, both really, really interesting interviews and give a really a decent insight into how they approach the film the nuances behind being advisors on the film um so this episode what we'll do is we'll do our normal cast production ali tally favorite scene general thoughts but we'll include some of those parts from the interviews and then later on we'll have those two interviews together in a special yeah yeah so this interview might be a little bit it won't be as long as those uh, other interviews because it would be this episode would probably breach the runtime of the film um yeah which is nearly three hours long. 157 minutes. It probably would be. Of course, yeah. talking about the film would be yeah. hilarious. I, that, we should have done that just for the just for the laugh, the lols. But... See how see how the ACOS metric likes that. Crikey. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, maybe um, we should just do uh, cast very briefly and then Matt could do some production. So in terms of cast, it's a very, very big cast, but really there are only a few major players in this movie. Everyone else is an ancillary um, in a way, it, the film is more mm-hmm. about Napoleon's relationship with Josephine than it is about really about anything else. Obviously, there is more in there than just him and Josephine. But principally, at your core, you have Joaquin Phoenix. He's coming off of a sort of a bit of a career renaissance uh, by playing the Joker. Um, it really sort of brought him back to the fore, um, I think, of the the, the sort of A-list uh, um, listings, if you will one of a better phrase um he's been in walk the line as i mentioned joker um her inherent vice i love that film i think he's great in that um you were never really here and of course worked with ridley scott before on gladiator um then we have vanessa kirby who plays josephine um she was in jupiter ascending the mission impossible franchise i think the the recent couple of the new ones i know matt's seen them i haven't yeah i'm not a big mi guy um, and she was also in The Crown. Matt's laughing there, MI guy. Couldn't think of what this I'm not. I'm not. I love it. I love it. I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna have to send that on to uh to Tom. Yeah. Mr. Cruz, Mr. Cruz. Robbie said this. <laughs> and then we have Rupert Everett as Wellington. Um, I remember him best for voicing the prince in Shrek 2. Um, but he also uh, appears in Stardust, uh, Inspector Gadget. <laughs> <laughs> um and uh my best friend's wedding um and a lot more other things but there's a few things i picked out there uh, does an okay job as wellington i think he yeah. t- to me he just looked a little bit too old for wellington yeah that. uh yeah if it had been parliament era wellington when he's a bit older mm. death yeah, wellington been, era yeah prime minister period perhaps yeah yeah that would have worked i'd love a film about wellington anyway there should be a wellington biopic yeah. rupert everett enacting the corn laws or whatever it was that'd be great with his with his little hearing hearing horn that he used to have apparently um because he got a bit deaf yeah watch richard holmes's documentary on wellington folks it's absolutely fantastic the iron duke it's all on youtube it's superb good book too yeah a good book yeah 
Um, then we have a few little uh, uh, side characters for you. Ian McNeese playing a friend of the show. You'll remember him from Ungentlemanly Act, um, uh, playing King Louis the Seventeenth. Only in a couple of scenes, has one line, very very brief. Um, Kevin Eldon was an, was a weird inclusion. Uh, Ridley Scott must be a fan of uh, alternative British comedians. <laughs> um, people I'm might so- know him from playing one of the cops in Hot Fuzz. Um, he was also in Four Lions, and I absolutely adore his um, It's Kevin sitcom from, I think, 2010-ish. It's absolutely fantastic if no one's ever seen that, if they're into sort of weird, surreal alt comedies. Kevin Eldon's your man. Um, just nice to see him. He was playing uh, Dr. Corvistart, who was Napoleon's uh, doctor in the film. Um, and then we have Phil Cornwell playing uh, a, uh, uh, what's the word, executioner. Um, he's yep. in, he doesn't even have any lines, um, but he he holds up Marie Antoinette's head. Just hold up her head really minutes. well, though, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah. Um, and then you have uh, Miles Jupp, another British uh, comedian playing Emperor Francis the First, which I thought was quite interesting. Um, but all these all these other characters that they're, they're very they're only there to sort of serve Napoleon. They're not really there to do much. Yeah, um, it's, it, we'll talk about this later on, I'm sure. But it, it the film could do with just giving a little bit more life to its supporting cast, I think. It could breathe a little bit. Um, mm. And I think, and we're going to talk about this later, and we should probably clear it up now. If you don't already know, um, this version of the film is a theatrical cut um, that's been put together from a supposed four-hour cut that's going to be released later on Apple TV. Um, so mm. this film's been released by Sony Pictures theatrically um, in the hope of it doing well on the uh, awards circuit. Because we are, yes, we are in Oscar season. Um, it's it's already begun. Um, so, you know, will will Napoleon pick up any Oscars? I, I certainly think it could pick up a one for costuming. Um, it's very, yes. very, yeah. um, very uh, uh, good with that. Um, but, we, but we shall see, you know, will it clean up or will it not? It's um, it's doing quite healthy at the box office at the moment. I think it's projected to breach 70 million, which isn't bad. Already has 80 million. Already has. Already. Yeah. Oh, wow. There we go. So I'm I'm breaching into Matt's part of the show. So Matt, production. Yeah, so as we know, directed by Ridley Scott, uh, we recently covered his very first film, The Duelists, which is set during the same era. Um, best known for Alien, Blade Runner, Thelma and Louise, Gladiator, Black Hawk Down, Robin Hood, The Martian, and The Last Duel, um, and uh, the Gucci movie as well. Lots and lots of lots, lots and lots of films over the years uh, covering very different topics: um, military, non-military, um, historical current future all sorts of different things so the film was written by david scarper who has a a pretty small credit list including uh the last castle which is a james gandolfini and robert redford i like that film about 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 the uh, military prison uh the day that the earth stood still in 2008 um with scott he worked on uh, all the money in the world in 2017 napoleon this year obviously and Gladiator 2 coming out next year. Um, he was also the uh, executive producer on 10 episodes of the Man in the High Castle adaptation um, wow. that came out a couple of years ago. Uh, he also wrote three of those episodes as well. Cinematography was handled by Darius Walski, um, who worked on The Crimson Tide with Tony Scott. Mm-hmm. Uh, all of the uh, Pirates of the Caribbean films, I believe Prometheus, The Counselor, uh, Exodus, Gods and Kings, The Martian, Alien, um, Aliens, uh, All the Money in the World, The Last Jewel, um, House of Gucci, and of course, Napoleon. So you can see from this that Scott's drawing on people he's worked with over a long time. Um, similarly, uh, the music was provided by Martin Phipps. Uh, who uh, provided the score for Peer Point, if you remember that, um, with, um, I forget the name of the chap. He was a um, very well-known character actor, but Peer Point was the the, the hangman. Um, okay. Uh, he, he was the, the UK's last hangman. Very interesting. I don't know, I didn't uh, see show. that. No. Yeah, it was on, I think it was an ITV production. Uh, he also worked on Harry Brown, uh, the, the Virgin Queen, Black Mirror, uh, War and Peace, um, Victoria, The Crown, uh, The Railway Children 2, 
The film was produced by Apple Studios, as Rob's already mentioned, and uh, Scott Free Productions, which is Ridley Scott's own production company. Good name. And it was it's a good name, isn't it? It's a great name. It, it, it is pretty good, actually. You've got to hand it to him on that one. Yeah. Distribution was handled by Columbia and Sony Pictures, and uh, in the future, it'll be handled by uh, Apple TV Plus on the in terms of streaming. The theatrical release that Rob uh, mentioned there has a, a, a runtime about one hour 57 minutes which is just under three hours so we're looking at another hour and a bit for yeah. the streaming release we're looking we're potentially um i don't think a, an actual runtime for that has been nailed down just yet that'd be a two day for me i think i'll have to do yeah. that in chunks yeah yeah i think so that's longer than the the, the recent beatles documentary that um oh, is it? That jackson put together yeah but a lot yeah, of that, which a lot is of that like beatles documentary is, is them sitting around getting pissed off of each other like you know you can fast I mean, maybe that's what that. maybe that's what napoleon redux will be just napoleon and, and josephine sat around getting like drinking and getting pissed off each other i don't know <laughs> napoleon and josephine working on that tough then they go studio up on the roof album and, and play a gig i don't know um, budget 200 million uh, and as as we mentioned earlier box office has approached or just surpassed 80 million um, and it has reportedly done quite well in France despite dividing yeah. opinion um, I guess it's everyone just being interested to see what the depiction of him is like it's, um, it's doing better than I thought it would do at the box office like I I thought it might struggle personally uh, but it's we will okay. see how it how, how well it does um, over this weekend the second weekend is always the teller I think mm. I mean, um, to be fair, like when we were at the cinema, it, we went to a very late showing at 8.30. Hmm. But there was a sizable portion of people there, even for a late night. Yeah. It was about, I think it was about yeah, 50 people fair. there. It's not hmm. bad. I don't think, no. I can't remember the last time I was in a cinema and the cinema was full, even on a like day one release. Um, I remember yeah. Yeah. I remember going to see Tinker Taylor Soldier Spy the day it came out and there were three people in the cinema. It's weird, isn't it? Sometimes like that. Yeah. Um, locations include uh, Calcara near Valletta in Malta uh, for the uh, the Toulon scenes. Beautiful place, being there. Beautiful. Um, Paris, Lincoln, uh, Bournewood in Surrey, which was also where the Gladiator uh, forest scenes were were, uh, were filmed. Um, also, uh, some scenes were filmed in Oxfordshire. I believe the Waterloo sequences were filmed right. um, there. Uh, historical advisors on the film. Of course, we'll be talking to Louis Chevalier, um, Dr. Louis Chevalier, and, and Paul Bittis, um, but also noted uh, Napoleon uh, historian uh, Michael Brewers uh, was also consulted uh, extensively during the early development stage. Um, uh, I think he's done a piece with Time magazine. Mm. I think um, I think Paul mentions that in Yeah, in he the does mention it in the interview. Mm. Um, in terms of... Um, other elements of production, the uh, the weapons, a lot of the weapons, including the muskets and the swords, etc., and the pistols, were all provided by Bapti, the well-known armourers, um, with uh, Ben Rothwell acting as the master armourer, um, in Innes Knight act, acting as the technical armourer, and Michael Buchan uh, acting as the supervising armourer, as well as a number of other guys as well. Big production, you need a big armoury team. You do. And then most notably, we've got David Crossman, who provided the costume design um, for the military costumes. And he's worked on everything, including uh, Saving Private Ryan, Enemy at the Gates, Captain Corelli's Mandolin, Pearl Harbor, Atonement, Valkyrie, War Horse, um, Lincoln, 1917, and uh, most recently, the Indiana Jones Dial of Destiny film. And he's currently working on um, the Blitz as well, the uh, upcoming um, Blitz movie, which is, is out. Is that a Ridley show. Scott film? No, it's. I think it's Steve McQueen. Yes, yes. I, yeah. I, someone reported the other day that it was Ridley Scott, and I was like, no, no, it's no, it's not. I, it's. I think it's definitely Steve McQueen, um, which looks from the from the production yeah. stills that we've seen, it looks promising. This it's costume good, design yeah. definitely it's looks got, good. Um, it's got Paul Weller in his acting debut, apparently. Wow. Wow, well, yeah. let's hope he does something not, to everyone. It's not his acting debut though, because he was in Ideal with Johnny Vegas in like two thousand and eight. That'll that'll be one for the cast when we you do. Don't it. ever say you don't get amazing facts on this show, folks. You heard it here first. So moving on, and we don't have a retro review this week. Well, because they're not retro, because the film's only been out days. Um, but we do have the one word review, and we Ooh. put out. Um, we put out the one word review literally minutes after we'd seen the movie, um, and we've got some. 
varied um uh, i think and mixed uh, one word reviews this week so hold on to you hold on to your napoleon hats folks brian williams says boats ken d campbell goes with silly uh paul can goes with inept jim duduku goes with chaotic historical firearms um our very own matthew moss went with hubris lance nielsen goes with forgettable andy moody uh he he didn't put any spaces so it counts scoped baker rifle A.D. Bond went with Controversial. Stuart Fitz L. went Vive le Empereur. Marcus Cribb went with Laughable. Second World War Books, Dubious. Sean, Formidable. Point Zero, with an amazing pun, Diddly Squat. Pete the Paint just went with Why. Um, Harry Black Maskers went with Merd. Uh, Dr. Stephen Marushin, uh, Maruterin went with Moch. Uh, Patrick Lovell, Disappoint. Gary Clark went with boring. Mark Trowbridge, self-congratulatory. Uh, David Bowen went with unseen. Fair play. I think rounding us out this week, Stephen Adcock went with artistic license. I think that's the crux of it. Artistic license is the, the catch hot word term of the day. for this. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, it's the hot word of the I day. Don't, I, I don't know. I, t- I tell you what, when I when I when that when the credits rolled, I did not know what to think. I was I was me and Matt were in a daze, weren't we? I've ruminated over this film for about four days now at this point. And having spoken to, to Loris and listened to Rob's interview with Paul, I've mellowed a little, but I, yeah, I, I came out of this film dazed and stunned. I think I have big issues with this edit. Now I'm, mm. I'm, only, I'm saying that because obviously I've not seen the four hour, but I don't know how much the four hour can redeem in my head from what I saw at the cinema. We yeah. said this at the time, and I don't. I don't think more is going to improve. What we've seen, yeah, yeah. I mean, and this is obviously getting his final thoughts territory. We'll do a proper final thoughts at the end, but I think before we get into the alley tally, let's hear some of my interview with military advisor Paul Biddis. Hello there. Sorry to interrupt. I wanted to let you know that you can now join our supporting cast over on Patreon. As thanks for your support, you'll be able to help us pick films, submit questions for guests have first pick on brand new and exclusive merch, and much more. Thank you for your support. Now back to the show. So um, that was the intro of the episode there, and I'm now joined by Paul Biddis, uh, the military advisor on Napoleon. Um, His credits include um, The Great Escaper, 1917, The Crown, Fury, and, of course, the upcoming uh, Ridley Scott's next film, which will be Gladiator 2. Um, So, Paul, my first question for you is is a simple one. Uh, How did you get involved in the film? I was on, um, I was doing some shoots for a film called Serrano. The unit production manager basically said, oh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm working on uh, something called Kitbag. And it's all about, you know, Napoleonic stuff. And I said, oh, okay, yeah, I've, I've done Napoleonic stuff before. And she says, oh, well, look, no, I want to put you forward for it. And I'm like, okay, fine. Because Joe Wright was basically bigging me up and saying I was his comfort blanket when I was on the show. Um. So, yeah, then I went to a meeting and then I was asked, all right, do you have a thick skin? I'm like, yes. He goes, okay. Um, So this is the project. Now, when I walked in, there was like storyboards already there. There's storyboards. It's like everything's already been mapped out, even before I'm actually involved in it um, or even seen a script. That's basically it. I, I, I met the production staff and... You know, they have to make sure that the person they're bringing on board, first of all, has the, 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 the credits behind him to know that he's worked on a film set, that he understands the process, um, that he's not someone that's going to be constantly running around saying, you wouldn't do this, you wouldn't do that. You've got to try and provide solutions um, to problems that are faced towards you. You know, you've got cameras, you've got all these various different things um, that you have to take into um uh, into consideration, different departments you have to take into consideration. So they want to make sure that they've got the right person for the job that's actually got experience working on film sets. Um, and so, yeah, and then that's it. Then I, all of a sudden I got told exactly what it is. Um, and it went from there. And in terms of uh, you on the shoot, how long were you on the shoot for? Like day one to the end? Or are you, are you coming in and coming out? So I was... Um, I was coming in every now and again um, for meetings and merely that this stuff has already been thrashed out. So well before um, myself or Larice 
for, for that matter, were involved um, a, a, a historical professor called Michael Bors. He's a professor in Oxford University. Mm-hmm. He was quite heavily involved with the writer and with the director. So a lot of stuff had been thrashed out. And I think there's an interview with Michael in, a, in Time magazine where a lot of the things which he saw in a script, he saw, him, are you really going to do that? And, you know, end of day, it's like, yes, that's what we're going to do. And mm. end of the day, he, he, all you could do is go, mm, okay. <laughs> yeah, I get your hands are tied at some point, aren't they, I guess? Well, look, end of the day, I mean, you, you don't, you, you're, you're, you're on this ride, but it's not your train set. Yes, um, that's a good way of putting it, I guess, yeah. And you are, you know, essentially you can only advise and you can only flag things up and you can write notes, you can write emails and you can vocalise it. But if you keep on doing it, they will start getting very bored of you. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you'll, you'll find your way on a P, you know, a P45 very quickly because you'll start, you know, if you start going on about that one thing, you're never going to move forward. And you've got to know when, what battles to choose, what battles to, to draw back from. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so you, so you know, for that, it's literally you, you're on there, and then you you look at the script, and even though when you're not asked to write notes, you write notes. This doesn't like this wouldn't happen. Blah 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 blah, and you you do it in a in a, in a very diplomatic way, um, because there's lots of egos in in the film industry, mm. and you know you you it's a very fine line to tread. So you've got to be diplomatic, and you've got to give some solutions to how certain things. Um, would work and the scripts evolve as well so you get the first script it then completely changes and then it changes again and then things get added then things get taken away so the script is evolving and the first time you see it all of a sudden it's in your email from that i guess um talking about script changing and things like that i guess um, what what was your biggest challenges on set for you as a military advisor what are the things that you 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 wake up one day and you go wow you know this is going to be a toughie right the, the landscape in which you've got to work now when I'm, you know, I'm, I'm I was I was like constricted to a budget where I was allowed to have a team for the boot camp mm-hmm. and then I was only allowed to have one person with me for um to help me with assist me with the filming because we've got um 250 in one part of of the of the um of the landscape of British and then 250 about a K away. Mm. we got horses and you got cannons and so I've got I said right you know I'd say to uh, my guy Romano I said Romano right I need you to stay with that side I need you to make sure the ADs don't move people out so I've got mm. my green ears I've got my line infantry I've got my I've got my my flank my flank um companies don't take that just make sure that the facings are correct that they're not taken out and the same goes for the French I've got my Voltigeers I've got my grenadiers I've got my my like my line infantry Please don't move those out of the way. Now, what happens? You've got ADs, assistant directors, mm-hmm. and they've got the first AD in there, and they want to impress the first AD, and they're running around sometimes like headless chickens. And this happens on most films. And so I'm running to one part, and then I'm getting a, a, a call. You now, Paul, you, you, you got to, you need to come over. You need to help us. Uh, FX, Paul, how, this, what, what would you be doing with this? So I've got to go up to the cannons. Then all of a sudden, I've got to run back to the where the directors called for me. And then I've got to, and I'm clocking up sometimes about 30 miles in a day. You've got to be very fit. Yeah, um, I'm sure. Yeah. And then what happened halfway through Waterloo, because I was always ribbing for it, Romano, you he had to go to the Ukraine to do, you know, for the obvious reasons. Mm-hmm. And, um, I always rib him for it. And I'm like, you you went able, you you, you deserved me at Waterloo because you left me on my own. Because then all of a sudden <laughs> I've got to do the whole lot on my own, running around, hardly eating. If it wasn't for some of the extras, I wouldn't have ate. Mm. Um, but so, I mean, but you've there's so many, every day is a very hard challenge. You know, when you work on a Ridley Scott film, he's got 11 cameras working on the go, right? And it's, and if one guy out of that 500 turns left instead of right, if he moves out, if he goes ahead of the line, if he, if he falls back because he's decided he's too tired, right? One shot could cost around about 60K, yeah, I'm going to say that the money implications of that the money is huge. implications, the time yeah. implications are huge. And if one guy cannot cut it, if one guy just forgets the basic drill that we're teaching them, he, you know, 
it's, it's it, it's gone. And and he will notice it. And then it's like, cut, right, reset. And then, you know, and it's not a good thing to happen. So every day was a challenge. But for me, my my uh, my sleepless nights was forming the square. Right, yeah, yeah. It was my sleepless nights because I'd train guys to form square from column and also from line. I'd train the guys to form column to line and line to column. And that's not an easy task when you've got 500 guys who the majority had never even touched a musket, let alone marched. Mm. Um, and, you know, that was, you know, you're doing, you're drilling it and drilling it and drilling it. And you've got to do a generic drill. You can't do 100% from the manuals. You cannot do the 100% because they're going to forget half of it. These, mm. these are not trained soldiers. Um, and if you, I don't know if you saw the last like, remembrance parade, yeah, trained British soldiers, trained men, TikToking. None of my guys were out of step ever. Yeah. When they were marching, I don't know if you've seen the, the video I put together. I put it all down. I put it together for the extras. I put a video of the boot oh, camp. I think I've yeah, seen bits of that. Yeah. Yeah. And I train these. And, and this is we're training in a COVID environment as well. So you've got that. So I've got guys in, in various formations and we're having to test guys to make sure that we test every guy on muskets to see who is safe and proficient. We've got armors. It takes a long time for the armors to load up the pans and the barrels of the muskets, they have to be taken out, they have to be loaded. Once they're all loaded and we know that everyone's safe, they're then put back in. And then we've got to do the, the, the moving forward online. Then we've got to halt. Then we've got to form that the square. Then the, 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 the cavalry come. And that was all done in one. And then they got to fire mm. on numbers. And they have to fire on numbers. And you get some people, oh, that, they should be firing in companies. And, that's all well and good, but when you having to make sure that everything's safe and everyone is fired by a number, because you have to ensure that if someone hasn't fired, that they then got after a cut, they've got to be extracted and that weapon's got to be cleared. So unlike a real battlefield, there is more safety precautions. There's also the COVID. People have got to put their masks on. And then you've got to remind them to take their masks off just before action. But in terms of the square, like there's always something I think about. So, you know, I've seen 1970 Waterloo, you know, red accounts, things like that. How hard is it to train extras who are probably coming off of God knows what before doing Napoleon, they're being trained up. How hard yeah. is it for them to get them to stay in that square when they've got cavalry charging at them? All the guys, they stayed, they stayed the course. They did not move and wow. they all enjoyed it. You know what I mean? We, we, we taught them how to, how to do the square with, you know, in a, in a, in a, a non or sort of pressurized environment. We used the barracks, which I want to go into about the barracks that we use. Yeah, please do. Very important. Um, and you know, then we get them on the field. When we, the first time they get to have all these horses, about a hundred horses charging towards them, and um, they loved it. You know, but we also got to remember that there's just safety distances as well. We've got horses coming towards, but we also had to ensure that when these guys fired. They weren't firing directly at the horses. So the horses couldn't go directly in there. But then we'd have stunts placed in certain positions. Mm. So that when you do have a horse coming through, um, or you've got that, like you know, there's one where a horse goes like flying over. Which yeah, is one yeah. Of, it's one of the Great. really, you know, trademarks that he mm. likes. Um, you know, you've got stunts positioned. So you have to make sure stunts are positioned in the right place. If we've got some some dirt hits coming out to, to represent a cannonball going through the ranks, you know, you have to have stunts there. Guys are on jerk rigs. Um, and there's all these different elements that you've got to put in there that people don't actually realise. Um, we got we had a cannon that gets hit. The cannon goes flying over. We had stunts around that, and the, the cannon is on pulleys. So, again, you've got this cannon that goes flying in the air and mm. skidding towards the camera. Um, so all these elements, there's so many different working parts. Yeah. Um, and I think the square bits for me were some of the best, like technically and filming. Like, you know, you've got lads coming in and, you know, the, the line infantry yeah. setting about the the the, the cavalry and when he falls. Like, that's all very visceral and very good, very well done. Oh, the shot is an aerial shot of the, the cavalry going round the square. Yeah. Like, that is just a fabulous shot. Really nice. That was my sleepless nights to get that, to get it mm. done it done first time they did it first time and really is on the you know he's like 
oh, marvellous, buy these man a pint, God bless them. And he was so happy. And, and then I was getting told, look, he's so happy with that. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, right, well, I'm so happy because now I can have a sleep. <laughs> uh, because it's it's a manoeuvre that could that could easily have you know screwed up mm. so easily. It, it would have taken one guy to mess it up. Mm. Um, and, I've, and I've seen like reenactors do this stuff, and sometimes they're not perfect. They mm. and they do it as a hobby, and they do it time and time again. And I've got we're all, videos, we're all human at the end of the day. Aren't we? And sometimes we're, we're we're too busy looking at everything that's going on. And I've got these guys reacting to orders. I had former serving um, NCOs that were in certain positions. So they were able to help guide the men. I had, you know, former NCOs who were sergeants and they were able to guide the men as sergeants would have done at the time. Um, NCOs on the flanks, uh, junior NCOs on the flanks. So they're helping the lines going in and everyone communicating. And, you know, I've got some good close-up footage that I eventually I will be able to once it's had its good run, I'll be able to put it out because you'll see the workings of it inside, you know. And it is it is good. I had light infantry coming out and firing some harassing rounds and then coming back mm-hmm. in painted out. Oh. But it, <laughs> so you mentioned um you mentioned those barracks there. Um I know that was something you wanted to talk about. So I think was you you were training in Napoleon on a Yeah, barracks? so Calvary Barracks in Hounslow. Um, it, it was a former barrack. It was the last regiment was the what the see, the Irish Guards that used it, and um, the barracks, the the prey ground, um, was actually set up, I believe, in um, seventeen ninety three, and this was in in um, this was because of the French Revolution, and the, mm-hmm. and the British government decided, right, hang on, we need to have a garrison close because if People start getting forts above their station. We need to have backup quickly. So they they erected this barracks, um, and it you know it started off as a camp on land, and then it started to grow. And the prey ground is, from what I've been told, um, is the actual prey ground which they they started using. It's, it's first of all it was grass, and then it just built up over then. Mm. And so the men that were trained for the Battle of Waterloo was trained on this prey ground. Out. Now it's the MOD had sold, sold it and to, to a private company. It's now being redeveloped into plush flats. And so I, I explained to the men that the history of this barracks, and I said, this parade ground trained men who went to the Battle of Waterloo. You are training primarily for the Battle of Waterloo, and you will be the last large body of men who will try who will march on this square and pass out, because I have a pass out parade. Okay. Um, yeah, on the Battle of Waterloo, and you had some of the extras had a tear in their eye. They're like, "Oh my god!" You know, That's a great. It's, it's a lovely detail. It's a really nice little thing to have. Yeah, it's really yeah. good. And, it, and mm. it, it hit home with them as well. They to understand that you know, this is sort of you know, this is you're part of history here, mm. um, regardless of what the history is being told um, with what you're in, you know you're involved with. Um, you are part of this history. Yeah. Uh, and that sort of resonated with them and they and they sort of understood the you know what they what they was involved with. Yeah, oh, it's great. I love that. It's a lovely detail. And the next question, it might be more difficult to answer. Um, but we know certain controversies have come out after the filming, and you've got yeah. a lot of ac- academics online, a lot of historians coming out and 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 want of a better word, bashing certain elements of the movie. Um, but yeah. there's one thing that we talked about before we started the interview. So yeah. there's a scene where Wellington and, and a, uh, a green jacket has a scoped Baker rifle. Um, yeah. And that's, I think that's, that's got niggled quite a lot of people, shall we say. Um, oh, yes. yes. <laughs> that, I mean, look, it niggled lots of people and it, yes. niggled, really, it, niggled, it niggled me. It, it, there's quite a few extras who, who were, you know, the, 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 you know, ex green jackets. And, it niggled mm. them. and it's like, we had conversations and a few notes and it's like, look, you know, the Baker rifle, there was no, there was no scope. The, the, the record, the first recorded scope was around about what was it, eighteen fifty three, I think. Something uh, late, late eighteen hundreds, yeah, surely. Yeah, yeah, it was about eighteen. I think it was about eighteen fifty three, and that was the first recorded, note recorded. Um, mm. And I was like, you know, is you know, there was there was a there was dialogue that happened in respect to, I could fight, but it was more from artillery. An artillery piece, and obviously Wellington said, "No, that's not what we do." Mm. Uh, but 
you know, I think what it is is that really wanted that visual, that visual thing, regardless okay. of it being wrong. Mm. And so, yeah, I mean, we mentioned it. The armor mentioned it. Um, I believe Luis even mentioned it. Um, but the, it is what it is. End of the day. And sometimes when you're, you know, and, and I, I call it my my Hank and Charlie moment. Okay. Right? So, me, myself, and Irene, when he's at the cash register, and the woman bumps in in front of him, and all of a sudden, a kid with a trolley, and all of a sudden, he changes. Comes oh and yes. Goes, Hank. I have that sometimes, and then I have to quickly change back to Charlie again. Because you have the grit, and you mm. know you're like, I am gonna get bashed for this. Slated for that, yeah. It, and I guess it, it harkens back to what you said earlier, where you know you you can't if you keep saying about it, then it, it, it can stall the production. It can you know bad blood can ensue. It, it's it, it it just creates it just like you know, and I, it's just one of the things where you you've got to suck it up. And you know it's wrong. And then so what I do is I, t- I sort of tell myself, and I, I go back to my time in the army, and I'll, I'll give an example. Soldiers do experiment. Soldiers through the years have experimented. They've, and I'm, I'm like, okay. And this is my like my comfort, my comfort thing, my like to try and tell myself saying that, look, you know, who's to say a soldier plundered a a telescope off an officer, and he's fought. Let's see what happens if I was to take this to my rifle. Let's wonder if this would make me a better shot. Yeah. We now, call it head head cannoning on the show. You head cannon it, don't you? Yeah. So yeah. it's like this. Let's try this. I never, you, know, you never know. Now we know that never happened at Waterloo. We know yeah. that 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 never happened. But the scope on a on a on a Baker rifle, there was no one to say that some soldier wanted to be Ali, he wanted to stand out, and he thought, oh, let's take this with a bit of tape. Let's see what happens. Now I can give instances like. When I was in Kosovo, we didn't have Picatinny rails on our weapons and we wanted laser pointers. Mm. And the reason for it was there was a lot of looting going on and all we wanted to do is pay, put a laser pointer on and that scare them off a bit. We had no Picatinny. There was no – we weren't issued lasers. We weren't, So we we bought lasers. We went and bought some lasers out of a shop. We got some lolly sticks. We tried to bore sight it to the weapon and then it's black insulation tape. Yeah, yeah. It, it's something that we've tested out. That's an, a, that's a, an example of – yeah. You know, you are you are manipulating your testing kit to see how you can work. And then what happens years down the line, all of a sudden, you've got Picatinny rails, you've got this, you've got that. You know, we're not having to put uh, we're not having to put tape on the, on our webbing to, to tape up all the loose straps because now it all comes with l- lucky bands on it, you know, all the mm. you know, elastic on it already. So there's so much so. So that's my comfort blanket. I see. Yeah. I think it's been lost in the in the in the melee this week. Someone has actually Bought this to someone and said, "Look, this isn't it. It's movie making at the end of the day." And it is movie making. It's spectacle, and yeah. that's the whole job of it is. It's it's putting bums on seats. And I think um, from nineteen seventeen, uh, Sam Mendes he said it. He said it as well. He said, "Look, I'm not making this movie for for World War One enthusiasts. I'm making this movie for millions." I understand that. Yeah. Yeah, and the same, you know, the most people that are, are going on about are people who are historians, and rightly of so. Course. Yeah, I mean, the, the, what annoyed the thing that annoyed me the most it wasn't the wasn't the sniper rifle really, um, it was the fact that Hugamon Farm and La Haye Saint wasn't in there. But I guess that's a, that's another question. But you, he wanted to put it in there. Okay. But he was restricted by budget and time constraints. He wanted to put that in there. He wanted to get get at least one of them in there because the whole point is he was trying to show this. Uh, this time where you know that you know they was trying to show um, the drama of what this battle was, but he was he was just he had he was up against it. Even someone like Ridley Scott is up against it. There's always someone higher up who who is pulling the money chain. Nice. Um, so yeah, he wanted to, but he had to film this and then he had to move on to the next. Um, because what happens is as well, you you when you hire land and when you, you it's not a case that you just hire a piece of land um and then you you've got free reign of it forever. Mm. Um, you've got to be out of that country and into Malta to do the Malta side by a certain point, and you've got to be finished in Malta by a certain point because another production company is coming in to use that that set. Uh, and so you are you've got so many constraints against you. Hello, I'm Al Murray, and you're listening to Fighting on Film, the world's number one war film podcast. 
So that was some of my chat with Paul Bidis there. Uh, stay tuned later in the week, or if you're listening after um, the episode's gone live, it's probably out there ready for you to listen to in full. Um, but maybe we should get into the actual Ali Tally, talk a, a, a little bit about some of the things we saw. It's not going to be as in-depth because we saw it at the cinema and I'm not paying another 15 quid or whatever it is to go and go and go, oh, is that a brown breast? Oh, is that a, is that one of them <laughs> blue funny water bottles they had? Um, and I don't think they'd appreciate me getting up with a magnifying glass going up to the screen. On to the Ali Tally. It's time for Ali Tally on Fighting on Film. In general, um, I think costuming and um, and props and uh, what was pulled out of the armory looked good, really good. Yeah. Um, lots of to look um, at. There's nothing wrong with this. Absolutely, lots of shallow bill muskets, lots of brown besses. Although there's a lot of floppy bayonets, although Paul does mention that. Um, there's what a lot do? of it's health and safety. I, mean, I guess exactly. It's, it's you safety. think by now we'd have managed to invent a st- slightly more sturdy rubber bayonet, like a you? fiberglass thingy. Or yeah, the something. number of scenes where you see one off, just like poop, and it's yeah, just like, uh, you know, yeah. like, a, like one of them doors. No wonder <laughs> Napoleon wasn't wounded at too long with all those floppy bayonets about. Um, Sacrilla so, and floppy bayonet has bounced <laughs> off me. We have to fight another day. So a couple of things stood out to us when we watched it. We we, we both quite like Robespierre's little pocket pistols he pulls at the uh, they, at the convention. They were very nice, yeah. Where he he kind of like holds off some of the baying crowd with one, and then tries to like shoot himself with another. And that did happen. So that it, although he wasn't at the convention and he wasn't, you know, holding off the baying crowd when he did it. Right. Um, I think he was at home when they. He came for him and he, he shot himself then. Um, but again, it's artistic license. It's much more exciting to have him oh, yeah. know, holding off the, the baying conspiratorial like masses of convention. Pistols. Cool. Yeah, with his dual wheel that like come yeah. at me, boys. Um and it's quite a quite a vivid scene where you see where it shot away his jaw and stuff. And yeah, the guy puts his finger in it. Yeah, he does. Oh. I, it, I think that might have been like a, a nod to um, the moment when he was later executed at the guillotine, when the uh, the executioner whipped off the handkerchief that was holding his jaw together. Oh, and he, right. he let out a massive scream as he. I mean, you've already shown Mary Antoinette getting her head locked off. Exactly. So there's no it's... point doing another guillotine scene because yeah. it's just not going to have the same weight, is it? Um, but we like those, and we both sort of tend to each other in the similar. Like, ooh, Bapti actually published um, some great photographs of some of the prop weapons, including. Napoleon's uh, chasseur et cheval sabre, um, which he literally pulls out and charges with a number of times, um, which he should have only done once, probably. But anyway, um, artistic license. You uh, exactly used at Waterloo, um, and the detail on it was gorgeous. And some of the others were really nice as well. Um, all the cannons recoil, which is nice. They're all behind uh, gabions, which you know those wicker baskets filled with earth. Which they wouldn't have done. Napoleon liked to wield his cannon like pistols. He yep. famously he liked to move them around to get good effect. <laughs> so he wouldn't in a fit in in a fixed siege. Yeah, he would have had gabions and you know dug them in. But the battles like Waterloo and Austerlitz and etc. They they wouldn't have dug them in like that. Um, oh well. And then of course I guess finally there's the Baker sniper. Yeah, so that, the, that the, uh... you heard about that in the interview, um, mm-hmm. and I, when I was in the cinema, I was aghast. I must admit. Um, yeah, it kind, was... it kind of put the top hat, or the, I should say, you know, the bicorn on things. Um, <laughs> put the cherry on the top of the cake, didn't it? It really did. I was like, "What is this?" And then, yeah. spoilers, he takes a shot towards the end of the battle. And it makes like a twenty millimeter hole in yeah. in Napoleon's <laughs> hat, at like all looking cannon seven round one, hole, yeah. seven hundred yards. So there's a bit where um, there's a, a rifleman of the ninety fifth rifles offers to take a um, Napoleon's in range, uh, offers to take a shot, and Rupert Everett as well. Wellington says no, generals are not in the business of shooting at one another, and that is a uh, you know Wellington quote. Handled much said. better in. 1970 Waterloo. Yeah, because uh, and you know a gunner, royal artillery officer comes up and says, "We have yeah. him in range. 
um, we can we can have a crack. It would have been hard like, as no. fuck to knock Napoleon out at the start of the battle. Like that would have yeah. been cool. I mean, I wouldn't put it past Ridley to do it because he did that with the Mamelukes, didn't he? It would have been anyway, funny. The the three seconds of the Egyptian campaign we, we actually got. Um, would have been a uh, nice little fake out if he'd have if it had been like a dream that Napoleon had. It'd have been yes. a cool fake yeah. out. But yeah, obviously that would annoy people anyway. Um, yeah, but I mean, as as Paul has already said, like they knew there was issues with that. Obviously, yeah. it had been in the script. They decided to do it. It gave them that, you know, moment to to suggest that we uh, shoot Napoleon from a distance and that not be quite cricket. Um, and I thought about what Paul said, and I was thinking about it. And there there is evidence to suggest that you know riflemen especially rifle officers would have used their telescopes to spot targets and range yeah. people. Just makes sense. Um, they just wouldn't have strapped them to the rifle because there's no reticle. You could have painted a dot on if you were clever. Yeah. If you were clever and you, you spent like a good, good three hours at the range, like trying to sight in a, <laughs> sight a, in a, baker, a, a like telescope Christ. tied to a Baker rifle with what looks like a, a leather strap. It was the, it was the, oh, biggest... no, and the shooting sticks as well. I, I, the oh, shooting stick, yeah. yeah. It, it, it was and the biggest. Again, there is evidence of, you know, riflemen using sticks and using shakos and doing all sorts of quite, you know, surprising positions to, to get stability for very long shots. You know, Plunkett mm. did long, long shots in the peninsula. The 95th were very active around, I think it was La Haison. Uh, or Hougamont, one of the other, there was a pit that a lot, one of the battalions defended around Not one of the farms. Room. There's no Hougamont farm in this room. Yeah, exactly, we'll talk yeah. about what Lou and all the battles, I'm sure, later on. But yeah, the Baker rifle was a bit of a surprise and it didn't fit with the reality of the situation. There wouldn't be riflemen that far back with Wellington. They would they would yeah. have been up, the skirmishers, yeah. they would have been up front. Yeah, you're not going to waste um, those expensive AF Baker rifles. Not, not and then. very skilled riflemen, yeah. Very skilled think... riflemen, yeah. You're not, you're not yeah. wasting sharp and it's lads. But, but that aside, I mean, Ali Tali for me this week. I'll be very brief. Um, it, it, the costuming is really yeah. nice. The costuming and the mise en scène was was good. Yes. I thought Crossman's putting a lot of effort in. You can see the money on the screen. You know, there's a thousand extras. You know, as you heard in Paul's interview there, that yeah. you know, there's a thousand extras on screen. You know, not quite the, as many as we got in Waterloo 1970, but that's a completely different era of filmmaking. You know, they bulldozed down hills and built Hougamon Farm from scratch, and it's a different era. But, yeah. I mean, scale-wise, yes, it's there, but it, it, it's the things like the Baker Rifle, the, the missing Hougamon Farm, certain things, other things that rankle with me. But in terms of, of costuming and the basics of the Napoleonic era in terms of cannon weaponry it's it, it's all good um, you know it's not bad too at many all. flags too many flags as well mm. yeah too that's many been national part. flags too many I'm national joking. flags um but maybe that's for the viewer i think actually that that leads us nicely into some of our favorite scenes i think it does i'll i'll go first it's very brief for me as well very quickly because i'd like people to go and see it and have their own um you know get get their own appreciation for the movie good or bad um, but for me, the, the scenes or the scene that I liked the most was when they formed Square um, in mm. uh, Waterloo. Um, yeah. You don't get to see it very often on screen anyway. The Polonic Wars aren't depicted as far, as far um, as much as I'd like. Um, I think it's such a no. fascinating period of history um, from a from a, a soldiering point of view. Um, but they form Square, and you get you get cavalry smashing into the the, the, the squares. You get cavalry falling over the top of the rank and file. Men setting about the the cavalryman as he falls, you know, hacking into bits with their bayonets. Like it, it is very upfront, brutal, bloody. Everything you'd want from a, a square attack, and you get this beautiful. We talked about it in the in the uh, in the interview. You get this beautiful shot of a of a square being sort of rounded, for want of a better word. I don't know horse talk. Circled, circled. Yeah, that's it. Circled by French cavalry, and it just it just looks fantastic. Um, and I, I really did enjoy that, but the Waterloo section as a whole, oh boy, that's another thing. Um, but no, that was my favourite little sequence. I wouldn't say scene. Um, I struggled with this one this week, folks. Um, but yeah, for me, that's that's the, the square sequence is very very well done. For me, I really enjoyed that sequence too. I thought the the visceralness of of that fight was great. I thought the it's a very very difficult um, maneuver to pull off 
without in the doubt. period regular troops would practice that constantly because it was one of the most key formations that a, a battalion could form cavalry was of course the, you know the the bane of the infantrymen um if if they got in if they got struck while infantry was in line then you know there's very little chance that the battalion well, would the survive tank of their without massive casualties you know, yeah. they're, they're the, the shock the troops fear. and yeah really the fact that paul managed to get those 250 chaps 500 chaps to pull that off convincingly on film was very good um and you see them do it in a, in in a, that great aerial shot and it, it is good i i liked a couple of the other scenes i liked the um the royalist uprising the um 13th bond de mer uh where napoleon's brought in um to sort of quell the the revolt in paris and he he brings in his guns and levels them and fires grape into the the oncoming that was crowd visually stunning very very effective scene the the extras are seen just blown apart and then once the smoke clears there's a woman in an apron covered in blood crawling through the gore just yeah. shocked stunned um and that was very very effective in the cinema i i really thought that was very beautifully shot um and and, and well handled i thought that was very good um that was one of the the better parts of the opening you know hour or so uh that and toulon was good mm. although in reality toulon was was a, a a redoubt not an actual stone fort but again artistic license although oslitz wasn't particularly historically accurate it was quite a spectacular piece of you know cinema there was some nice cinematography yeah there was some great score there was um a scale to it which i i, I thought impressive although the tactics of the period were lacking and um i didn't think the laconic um air of napoleon going by the cannons have the troops advance from the north bring in the cavalry just very quiet hushed tones of him giving orders to mm. no one in particular if there'd been an aide stood next to him who would run off and given that order if you've seen 1970s waterloo you'll see aides coming to the you know the generals napoleon and wellington they receive orders and they ride off and and give them and then you, you see those troops going into action. Yeah. If you'd had a little bit of that, I think it would have shown that um, orchestral conductor. But this is the thing, Ridley. I don't think Scott is making a Napoleon at war. He's making Napoleon in love. And well, that's what I get from the movie. There's no point showing the flawed Napoleon and his relationship with Josephine if you don't firmly set up this exactly mammoth general you know mm. he's a titan of his period he's a titan he's, his campaigns are still studied he's probably one of the, the greatest generals who will ever live he, yeah you know he was a genius he was he was a genius of war and that is no exaggeration mm. it's i just think the film needed it to a little bit more to set that up and then yeah. i would have accepted the fact that he's being portrayed as a very flawed individual and showing all this various nuance that you don't expect going into it and i think really we'll talk about this later on i'm sure but i think the trailer set this film up to be something it isn't and i think that is why so many people are just shocked that coupled with the fact that people have this preconceived notion of the legacy of napoleon as this incredible general who is capable of so much and then to watch a film where he's comic almost in a lot of scenes. Yeah, you're, you're, scenes. you're breaching into final thoughts here quite, quite it's a just lot. It's a hard, isn't it? It's, it's very hard this week. But I think what we'll do before we actually get to those, um, you know, that chat about final thoughts and, and we try and give a more rounded picture of our opinion of the film, I think we'll have a little bit of my chat with uh, Larice and you guys can get a, an insight into the work he did with Ridley on the film and how some of those nuances were pulled out of his research and the way we got him involved with the film. It was a really fascinating chat and I, I really appreciate him taking the time to come on and, and, and talk with us about it because I think it kind of gives an insight into the constraints of being a historical advisor on a film like this, but also where some of the more interesting aspects of the film, be they what you expected or not, came from. 
can you tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, how you became a historian, and also how you began to be working in film? Okay, so um, I am. Um, I've started working with Ridley in 2019, but beforehand I used to be a curator in a castle in Burgundy, and uh, so that's my uh, background. I will get I will get a bit more into that story later, uh, okay. but. Uh, academically I have done a master's degree in I've studied my studies on 18th century French Revolution in Lyon then well uh, before that my bachelor was in political science then I done my master's degree in uh, one in uh, political science which I dropped in order to go more into history. I studied so a late 18th century Lyon, French Revolution, uh, and what happened there. And then I dropped that. I um I dropped that subject, but I kept my um I kept studying uh, history and I I ended up studying medieval history. Right. And I've done I've done seven year uh, thesis, so it's a very thick document in France it's, it's a bit thicker than what is done in the US I'm not sure really how thick theses are in the England but it's um it's 500 pages long so it took me seven years to do it and when I worked with Ridley I was still a PhD student in medieval history so now I finished that and I'm a doctor in medieval uh, history and literature so how um have I been working with Ridley I've been working with Ridley since 2019. So Ridley was doing recognition tours all around France, all around Burgundy with his team. And uh, I was in one of the castle, they recognized, they went for one of those recce's, as they say, in the castle. Um, we got, receive an email and it's Arthur Max, production designer on The Last Duel. Um, everything is kept secret everything we don't really know who the guy is we don't we don't have the name first they come on a recognition tour and we realize it's a big thing in the castle i used to work on in sorry and uh, after the second recognition tour we have a sort of little discussion about medieval liturgy so a, a liturgy so how mass happens and he's like oh do you want to work for us i say okay sure <laughs> And so I was a documentalist at first uh, in 2019, 2020. And then when the movie starts uh, filming, they call me up and they say, do you want to be a sort of historical military advisor? And have you got skill to speak to a lot of people? I say, yeah, I'm, uh, I've studied my, my work as a tour guide with kids. So if you can manage 100 kids at a time, I guess you could do on a set. So I was so excited. So the next day, I went from Burgundy to southwest of France, where the movie was shot, and I had a meeting, another meeting with Ridley, which we met a couple of times. I, I which, but he, he, he really wanted to go to dive in deep in the script of the Last Duel, and he asked me so many questions, military questions, um, liturgical questions. Um, how an homage happens, how praying, how a wedding happened in the 14th century. I give him anecdotes, options. I've got a method that seemed to have worked really well. He explained to me what's, what's going to be my role. It was a three and a half hour meeting. So it was very long, very tiring for me. As you can tell, mm -hmm. English is not, is not my main language. And the producers, Ridley, everyone was fusing with questions so it was a very very tiring exercise uh, but uh very you have to be very quick and sharp in your answers so you, you don't have time sometimes scholars like me we like to have long answers <laughs> to small questions um and that's not what the aim that's not at all what the aim is so it's um um it went very well on the last year we had a great relationship he asked me questions about music which i gave him and uh, it was then sent to the composer and he really liked 
what I could advise on the 14th century music. And we were discussing a lot about so many other things, anecdotes, Viking history. We had really time to, to speak outside work. Then I, um, after the movie, I went to his place in the south of France. So I got invited um, to, to we, got, we got to speak and I went to his place. Well, to one of his houses, it was not his private, private house. Um, but we got talking. And he, on the last, one of the very last day of the shoot, when we were in Ireland, so he was doing COVID time, very complex time film. And uh, he talked to me about Napoleon. He's like, how good are you on Napoleon history? I say, well, I'm not too bad. <laughs> He's like, yeah, I like your method. And um, I'm going to do the movie on yada, yada, yada. And so Napoleon, Josephine. And he says, you, you will be the historical advisor. Um, you might be, he said. Uh, but you will focus on that, on the last duel. Uh, in you, so I was working on the props, on the costumes, uh, a little bit. I was helping out. Yeah, so um, yeah, you just advise. You know, you don't make the thing. You just yeah, advise. Course. You're here to mm -hmm. help. Um, so, you know, but you've got all those people in departments doing incredible job and research. You're just here to help them out. Um, so you're a man of the shadow. And um, so he told me I was going to do Napoleon. And that I was going to focus on that to help him and to help the actors. How did you feel about that when, when he suggested that his next movie was going to be on someone as historically huge as Napoleon? What did you think about that? Well, he did a movie in between, which was Gucci. <laughs> of course, <laughs> and, yeah. And, yeah. Then, uh, and then he did that. Um, I was... Um, well, I was like, okay, let's get to work. So I had, so to me, as a Frenchman, I knew that I would have be. Um, and he says because you're a Frenchy, he calls me the frog. Like we, we get. He's, <laughs> it's funny, yeah. You know? He's got a weird sense of humor. But I really like. But he's got a good sense of humor. Anyway, and um, so he. So I got to me personally. How did I feel? I was like, okay, let's get to work because it's not my time period. It's not the, as much as I, um, the 14th century is not my time period uh, in my, my thesis is based on late 12th, early 13th century. Yes, it's close from the 14th century, but it's still, you you still got huge differences after mm -hmm. the, the the great plague um, of uh, uh, the, the mid uh, 14th century. So there's a, an evolution of civilization in late Middle Ages, which is not what I studied. So there was already a huge difference, and I had to work. Here, it's another world. And so I had a year prep. So I did around six hours of work a day, just based on that. You're not paid for it. <laughs> You're only paid when you get the final call. So um, the and so it was very huge work. I had to learn books by heart. There are a few books that I knew by heart and I still know very well on um, personal Napoleonic behavior. If you ask me something about how Napoleon would do certain things, or his taste, uh, states, sorry, hard to pronounce, uh, I, 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 could, uh, I could give you an answer. Um, so in January 2022, Ridley calls me and he's like, I need help. I need, I want to know more on Napoleonic music. What do you think? And he knew that I was really into old, weird style of music. And he's like, I want something a bit oriental or a bit. And so I said to him, you need to go Corsican. And I gave him sense, the, yeah. yeah, I said, and he, he knew it, he knew Corsican music, but he didn't know that specific Corsican music, which I sent him, which is a, a very, very talented man in French uh, musicologue, so a specialist in music. And he's, of, of course, a very, very good singer. And he's the one that does the music in the movie. He was employed after that. Uh, he went with his team to London uh, to register the, the music you hear at Austerlitz. And it's it's beautiful. It makes, it makes the, whole, the whole movie. I'm very happy about 
all the music I could have advised um, in the Napoli. And again, Martin Phillips, the composer, did an incredible job on that. I'm very happy about that. Anyway, and so um, uh, two weeks before the shoot, production calls me. They say, well, Laris, you're French. I said, yes. They say, you live in Paris, right? I said, no, I live in Burgundy. Uh, they say, well, but uh, Vanessa is coming to Paris. Uh, you've got uh, two days with her if you want and uh, she will visit places in Paris um, and you will arrange to make them empty <laughs> so <laughs> that's a big I, job. So, yeah that's uh, that was crazy so I I called my whole a whole lot of people that I knew and through networks and things like that I managed to get uh, two days with her um it was it was incredible uh, how they worked. I already worked with Matt Dayan with uh, on the last duel with Ben Affleck with uh, Adam Driver, mm-hmm. Julie Comer. They were really impressive too. Um, but I, I really had that time with her, and to see her dive into her role, she had time. We went to the Mal Maison where Napoleon had his private house, and she really wanted to reflect uh, on uh, near to hear the the floor crack to hear the ticking of the bells everything stayed it's a shrine that place if people that really want to visit something great near paris they have to go and see that it's pretty good and she really wanted also to see a tomb so we went there and it's not too far and then i received another call from the production they say well Joaquin coming is coming and he wants to do the same so we did the same thing. I did, uh, and I went in the army museum and in the army museum with him and also in the Malmaison. But we spent in the army museum um, three hours and 15 minutes of me constantly talking about everything. He went so fast in the museum, like it was walking up and down and things. And I was like, well, this is uh, Egyptian campaign. This is... Uh, a saddle for um, uh, a camel, a camel saddle uh, that was used at that time. It was like, okay, this, and I was explaining anecdotes about this, about here and there, and he didn't speak much. And then when he came, when we were on set, he remembered everything. We had a meeting on the first day on, of set, and he remembered everything. So it was so good for me because he created a great link and the producers did really well. And so with the actors, we worked very often for them to get more involved in their role, more involved in uh, in their character. Mm. And to it's a very difficult to grasp the complexity of someone like Napoleon who's oh, had imagine. multiple yeah. masks, like a theatre. So, and I believe it, it did really well. So... First question from one of our Patreon supporters, Andy Moody. He asks, um, when you work with a director like Ridley Scott, how much influence can you have on his filmmaking in terms of suggestion and injecting those nuances that you know you mentioned there about Napoleon's you know actual character? Well, um First, because Ridley Scott's yes. you know renowned for being very driven and, and very focused when he's directing a film, and he has a clear view of what he wants to 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 create. So, oh, definitely, definitely. Uh, but sometimes he, you have I have a technique check and chair. It's five points. You have if I go to see him, mm-hmm. I have to be very quick. I've got half a minute maximum. I've got to tell a story, an anecdote. I've got this anecdote has to be visual. It has to be um, never seen in a movie before. And it, so visual, and it has to be historical and uh, sourced. So, and sometimes I bring, so with me, I have images Ridley is a very visual person he works less like a painter you know like I'm not the one painting he's the one holding the pen but and the photography the sets all those guys are preparing the paint and me I'm doing the pigments but sometimes I could bring a little bit of paint 
and he will take it. If I do those five points very well, he will take it. For example, I know people, it's, it's clearer with the example. When we shoot, Napoleon becomes a general. We are after Toulon in our story and Napoleon becomes a general. It's written that in the scripts, there's not much detail. And historically, we don't have many sources on how um, how this ceremony would have happened. Yeah. So, so Ridley is like, okay, how do we do it? But we've got the sun, the 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 scene. Have you seen the movie? I have. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So the the scene, the, the beauty of it is a uh, there's that beautiful sunset. In we are in Malta, and the sun is going down very quickly <laughs> and um we've got all those extras everything is ready um Tarheim, the actor the french actor has got his lines we we had a little chit chat about uh the, the discussion about his lines and joaquin we had a discussion about how napoleon would react with barras because in reality napoleon betrayed barras as we can see in the movie and ridley's like how do we do it and I say, well, here are three pictures of how ceremonies that would have happened at that time, not really military based, like the Federation uh, Festival, La Fête de la Fédération. So, uh, so I, sh I have it with me, the visuals printed out. And he's like, okay, let's do this. So I say, all the extras are in circle. Then Ridley's like, okay, we do double circle. So there are two circles. And I say, Barras is going to be pointing out his saber towards Napoleon's heart, and it's as in an initiation rite, as if you're under the threat. But and it, it would those sort of spiritual weird ceremonies would have happened in that post-revolutional, uh, post-revolutionary times. So it's and Napoleon becomes general by Barras which Barras was not there historically, but it's okay, we create the characters, so that's why he's there. And Napoleon and Joaquin improvise and asserts dominance right after that and leaves, and everyone's like, long live the general. So this scene is very visual, inspired a very with a very long distance with historical sources. We don't know how exactly it happened, but that's here how I could manage to help one, you have to think of the script. And me, my position is um, is a sort of a pillar of history. So you're here, you you can't tremble. You have to keep, you have to maintain. And uh, sometimes history, sometimes to say, well, uh, you could do that and it would be more accurate or you could do that. But if you go bluntly and say no, it's pointless because you can't really stop the machine and say, well, Ridley, uh, the Egyptian campaign didn't happen like that. So Napoleon never shoot the pyramids. Yeah, he knows that. Yeah. Napoleon, mm. uh, sorry, uh, Ridley completely knows. Everyone on set knew that Napoleon never shot the pyramids. But if you want to explain that the Turks that we see on camera are allied with the British, and the French are allied with the local Egyptians who were under uh, the attack of the Turks. And it's a sort of cold war in Egypt, um, if I make it clear. This conversation is a whole scene. And so it's the show don't tell. So, it, yeah. and it, it makes a very, um, it accentuates the fact that Napoleon is an artillery man. He just shoots, boom, makes a big boom. The guy on his horse back falls, he dies. End of the story. Um, so it's the kind of thing that the historical advisor has to accept for the sake of the story. So yeah. there's the, the history and you've got to understand that there is a story and you've got to accept and sometimes help out with tiny things here and there. And sometimes I got very lucky on this uh, because I'm working with Joaquin. Joaquin really wanted his character to be understood not as a tyrant but as a man of the people and so all those scenes have been added we work together and he's an incredible writer i gave him proposition and then he did things and sometimes um uh, scenes were added uh with um, more accurate or more accurate influenced 
sings mm. like that. So and really listens, definitely listens. So um, yes, he's very busy on set, but he loves history so much that he will always listen to me <laughs> on something like that. But you can't also bug him. Did you uh, advise on sort of the characterization that Joaquin uses? You know, so there's those moments early on in the film, especially where the the cans are firing and he, and he covers his ears. Is that something that you based on um, something you read or something from your research, or was that something that Joaquin worked up? Yeah, that's something. Um, when when we're in Paris, I explained to him all the physical details of Napoleon. We've got, for example, when you when Napoleon was stress dictating, his left um, leg would tremble slightly. His left calf muscle would tremble. It was like, ah, no. so he didn't like those. Uh, and it's true, it's not my role to direct him physically. Mm-hmm. He likes to be able to move and not to be in prison. In a, in a, a that's how I understood him. Uh, but what he really liked is all the accessories. For example, um, there is another character in this movie. It's Napoleon's hat. Yes, of course. Yeah. And, and I thought the, the, the costuming was amazing. Oh, it's it's, very, it's uh, gen- gen- And I love the recreations of all the various uniforms, you know, from the revolutionary period through to the consulate. I really hope uh, Jan T and David get um, rewarded for this incredible work. And, and the coronation. The when, when you wear, if you, if, you, if you like costumes and things like that, if you wear, coronation was, emo- uh, it was emotional. It was uh, definitely, I can't, I'm not saying that for, I don't know, drama. It was emotional. A lot of people, a few people cried, like the costume. Like it was, it, I, I've got to say, I, I had goosebumps. Do you say goosebumps? Yes. Yeah. I, yeah, I that definitely. is a very, it, it feels very much like you mentioned earlier that Ridley, you know, he works from paintings and he's very visually driven. It feels very much like the famous paintings of, of uh, Napoleon taking the crown and placing it upon his own head, and it, the whole visual cues right there, isn't it? But definitely, Co- Coronation is my, is a scene where I was um I was busy. It was my scene, you know? <laughs> so it's, it's not my scene, of course, but it's it's a scene where I was very involved for what anything to do with Latin, anything to do with that. I'm 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 here, so um, I was here also to to place people, and I had a massive print of the Sacre de Napoleon, so the coronation uh, from David. Uh, so, it, by the way, it's the only painting we know of that Napoleon liked. Really? Yeah, when That's Napoleon nice. was in front of it, he was impressed by his grandeur. He was saying the his, his grandeur, his greatness, like yeah. in the sense of yeah. the size and the uh, grand it was. He was like, it's not a painting, we can walk in this, because <laughs> uh, it's so huge. And uh, otherwise, Napoleon was um, not very impressed by paintings. He was not really moved by it, uh, something. He, he liked music more. Um, he had strange taste. And, and so did Josephine in paintings. Where I was going with this is, for example, a scene like that for Coronation. Uh, me, So I'm here. My role is to help people be placed. And here, what's where I was going with this is the fact that, you know, some people are complaining about how inaccurate, for example, um, a movie could be. But for example, the painting here, the painting is inaccurate. Where When you see the painting, it's not how the coronation happened. You've got Napoleon's mother that is there. She was not there at coronation. The layout of people is not accurate. All the paintings of most of the paintings of Napoleon his face is not his real face. It corresponds the Ingres, so the, the famous coronation when you see Napoleon standing up. It corresponds to the golden number, his face. So it's not accurate. So you oh, see, I see. Right. We can't we can't really compare. We can't really we have to understand that uh, an art piece will not be accurate, but it tells a story. And just what I re- yes, that's right. That's where I was going with this. There's been 107 Napoleon movies. And there's been a thousand people played who play Napoleon. So when I am with Joaquin and we discuss who Napoleon was, and we dive very deep into Napoleon's psyche, very deep um, into Napoleon's relationship with his mother, his mother looked 
like Josephine. If you go to the Malmaison, there's a room where Napoleon wrote his Code Civil, so the famous law code that he wrote. And you've got in that room two paintings and you've got a table in the middle. It was he, So he worked from home a lot. And the two paintings look symmetrical. But there's one of Josephine, one of Letizia Bonaparte, his mother. They look exactly the same. So he's got a sort of... Um, the relationship that he had uh, with Josephine is very, very impressive, very interesting. The the letters that Napoleon, uh, that Ridley, so he often make a mistake. <laughs> uh, I, I, I often say Ridley for Napoleon and the opposite. Um, on set, he's often called the general uh, Ridley. <laughs> so oh, well, that makes quite, sense, yeah. Yeah, it could be quite confusing. And... Um, so Napoleon uh, had that, um, yes, he was the master of, ta- of tactics. Yes, he was the god of war, uh, but uh, he was a very uh, very complex character and he created his own propaganda to his men, to the people, to his family, um, their relationships and fights uh, that they had in public with Josephine were like staged. People believed that it was staged just like it is in the movie when uh, it's completely wacky and improvising when he's, uh, uh, I think, when he says, uh, destiny has brought me this lamb chop. I like my meals, yeah. I like my meals. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, it's, fu- it's funny, and, but it's actually qu- very accurate because Napoleon staged, uh, so people didn't really know. And there was some, if you read the origin sources, the primary sources, Napoleon, for example, would try to seduce Josephine, but there was Hortense, so Josephine's daughter from the first marriage, who was in between. So she was sitting down and he was trying to say, we understand from the the memoirs of Hortense some sexually related uh, stuff to her mother. So, and she's in between. So how awkward would that be? Yes, mm-hmm. it's a man of his time, but there's a bit of awkwardness that um, Joaquin really liked to play with. And so, and uh, Napoleon was very sensitive with his skin, for example. There are things like that. Uh, we know from the sources, Napoleon is the most recording man ever. Um, so if you read interviews, so we worked with Ridley to, to prep and I, I was telling Ridley that there's one book a week based on Napoleon. So that's 10,400 books uh, just based on him. But everyone around this time around him wrote a book. It was it was a, a hit because everyone, especially in England, especially in England, uh, there was that Napoleonic mania at the yeah, time. Yeah, the fascination. Yeah. yeah, the fascination. And still now, still now, yeah. there's a British fan writing. The French, we don't realise. Uh, and they... They are very impressed. They don't really understand why the French are making movies on Napoleon. It's very interesting. I know, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. What a fantastic insight there from Loris, Um, talking to Matt there. Um, and if you want to listen to the full interview um, yet again, going to keep plugging it, um, wait for the special episode um, at the end of the week um, where you can listen to those interviews in full. So I guess we are into the nitty gritty, um, the mm-hmm. final thoughts this week. Um, and I know Matt was Matt was tangenting there quite hard, and I, I try to stop him. Um, if you were in the car on the way back um, to our hotel after we watched uh, Napoleon, there was some heated discussions, shall we say? Matt, do you want to begin with your final thoughts on Napoleon? It's it's difficult to know where to begin. I think I think one of the issues with the film is the script. I think it's a massive subject to try and condense even Napoleon's later life from his early twenties through to you know. His yeah. death. That is a huge, huge topic to cover and to condense into a, a sub three hour film. Um, and I, I appreciate there's going to be an extended cut and there'll be more detail and and some sequences will be included that uh, we've seen hinted at in stills and other things like that. But I just, I I don't think the script managed to do exactly what it was hoped, and I don't think there was. I don't think there was enough uh, dialogue that made us appreciate the skill of Napoleon 
a lot of it just seemed to be um, highlighting his awkwardness. It kind of paints him a little bit too D in the way that he interacts with um, various characters. The Polian was a very driven individual. He was very aware of his own destiny and, and how he could shape it. He was a master of propaganda. He was extremely charismatic. And we don't really get a lot of that. His men loved him. The closest we get to any hint of that is when he hands out bread on the, the march to Moscow or the march I like that Moscow. bit. That bit was That great. was a lovely little scene. Yeah. Um, and it perfectly illustrates the, the the bond that Napoleon had with his men. He would happily send them off to die. But at the same time, he understood that he needed to be seen to be, you know, looking after them. It, 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 it's it's an interesting film in that it's the the trailer almost set it up to be this Napoleon um epic with lots of battles and stuff. But then really we get the majority of it is that interpersonal relationship with yeah with Napoleon and Josephine. And I think really the chemistry between Kirby and Phoenix was lacking. I didn't feel that passion. Yeah. I just it felt very flat in some scenes. Some of it was almost shocking. The sex mm. scenes were, were were shocking, and I and I know that some historians have said that was based on accounts of his actual technique. Let's say, okay, um, which okay, that's fair enough. But it isn't yeah. what you expect to see. No, um, it's subvert. It's from trying what to... is supposing, but supposed to be this love affair slash viewing of Napoleon's life through mm. his relationship. I agree with Matt in many respects i i don't like the film i'm going to say that now i didn't like it i appreciate some of the things it was doing scale that some of the battle sequences work quite well for me technically you know yeah. there's nothing wrong with this in terms of uh you know costumes i've said in, in in final thoughts but it's for me that the big issues for me are i think joaquin phoenix and vanessa kirby are woefully undercast miscast sorry um, I think they're woefully miscast. I, I don't know. I'm racking my brains for four days trying to think who you would cast as Napoleon in today's A-list like circle. And I don't I don't think there's anyone right. Um, but I wasn't expecting the kind of performance that I got from Joaquin. Um I, I, he mm. played him I think I turned to Matt at one point saying Joaquin's playing him like a Jim Carrey or a John Goodman type bumbling buffoon at some points yeah. like i i just didn't like the characterization it wasn't what i was expecting i think rod steiger done a, a uh, i said on twitter rod steiger in five minutes shows a version of napoleon that we just didn't get in this movie i didn't buy him as this master general uh you know fantastic you know genius person that we're all meant to think that he is this movie didn't bring that for me um, I, I I think the edit is just too quick. It's too condensed. Scenes that are not allowed to breathe. Yeah, and it's a sequence of vignettes or tableaus. Yes, it it is a lot and like the duelists actually. Yeah, but no, it yeah. doesn't. The, each one of those vignettes. But the duelist does not, is about made up people, and that's why it works. Does not really convey. No, you know the weight of the character. No, it, it, exactly the way that the duelist and, is. And you you go through it far too quickly. Phoenix looks far too old anyway. Um, yes, he is which much too old, me. especially for those earlier sequences in Toulon. It very much it really rankled with me. Um, and and, just, and Kirby's much too young. Kirby's too young, and it's I think it, I think it's an issue of script. I don't think the script is the best. There's some really odd odd phrases and odd things put in there, like they're rounding up the the guys they want to abdicate oh, and do yeah. this coup. And there's a bit where they go into a guy, um, a, a guy and he's eating his breakfast. And he says, I want to finish my succulent breakfast. And we had a, <laughs> we had a row of um, teens, uh, like uh, what you'd call them, like, you know, it's lads sitting in front of us. And they were roaring at that laughing because they all turned around to each other and did the succulent Chinese meal meme to each other. Yeah. And then when me and Matt clocked that, we turned to each other and went, yeah, that is a really weird phrasing for that scene. Yeah, and Ben, and ben did as well. And ben, yeah, our Ben, friend our friend we who was with, us, with. Um, said it as well. I've said on the show before, if you've listened to our Julius episode, I'm not a big Scott fan. 
I've not been a Scott fan for quite a while. Um, I think he's past his peak personally. Um, I know that might rankle with a few people, but I just he's just not a director for me. Um, you know, Black Hawk Down was a good movie. I, I don't like his direction style. It's just, it's just not for me. And like some of his casting choices are odd for me. But I don't get how you take all of this information on board from from Loris, from Paul, from from other historians, just just basic research about Napoleon, and then you make this, and you let your lead actors do what they did to the script. This week, this film just did not work for me, and I don't... It's going to sound crass, it's going to sound sort of ignorant, but I don't really care about your four-hour cut. Because everyone goes, oh, Scott's films, you've got to watch the director's cut. You've got to watch the director's cut. And I'm like, but I shouldn't have to. I, I'm a big believer in your theatrical cut should be the best it can be because that is probably the version most people will see. Unless you're a real auteur, a real cinema person, you're not going to seek out a director's cut because you've seen it and you move on to the next thing. I don't know how this four hours meant to save this. Um, but that's just me. I, I really did not enjoy this movie. The dialogue at times, I know that some of it was drawn from uh, from correspondence, but I also know that, uh, as as was pointed out in, in the interview earlier, that Phoenix did also ad lib some of it in mm. what he thought would be the, the you know the way that Napoleon would address a situation like that. Again. The, the scripting was just perhaps not not quite there in in terms yeah. of that and for me some of the historical changes that were made just did not we've not even got into that yet have we work oh, and let me outline a couple so napoleon hurries back from egypt when he his brother tells him that josephine's having an affair he can't believe this Joseph, josephine did have affairs napoleon had affairs that was, you know, she kind of alludes of the to course. the movie, but doesn't. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he he actually, I think he does say when they're having that heart to heart by the fireside. She says, "Have you had affairs?" And he said, "Well, yes, I have, but they went. It's not the same." And that is no doubt what Napoleon would have thought. Um, of course, yeah. But anyway, it's just the fact that they they portray the reason for him leaving Egypt as being Josephine. They also kind of portray the reason him leaving Elba as being she's been talking to the Tsar and Josephine did talk to the Tsar and the Tsar was you know very friendly with her um, in 1814 but Josephine was already dead by the time he left Elba he knew she died before he left Elba, uh, um, Elba. Josephine just looks like she's got a bad hangover in those sequences y yeah no like it, he... it, it you, yeah, it doesn't set up her death in an no. impactful way either. I thought um, some of the things, the the the, um, the huge campaign, six hundred thousand, seven hundred thousand Frenchmen invade Russia, and Russia very, you know, cleverly didn't engage them directly more than a handful of times and pull back and let them take Moscow and then bent it down and they were forced to retreat in the depths of the, you know the the, the Russian winter. Those scenes, um, those retreat scenes were well, were well done. I they were good, didn't weren't hate they? Them. And they, Got they, admit. they, you could splice in a little bit of the duelist sequence there, and it would work quite quite nicely. I thought, yeah, um, they worked quite well. But then immediately, Napoleon did rush back, um, mm. and leave a lot of his men to to march into Poland and Germany. But the 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 thing is, he rushed back for political reasons, and. The film depicts those political reasons as being um, he's being forced to abdicate. But he didn't abdicate for another 18 months, two years. There were massive campaigns. That he's fight, he fought his biggest battle in Germany um, mm, yeah. in 18, 13, and 14. You know, and that could it could be in that four-hour edit. We don't know. It could be. You know, it's... Well, Bor Borodino's... Um, one, another one of his, you know, like great five victories, seconds of it, or, or, or Morango, I think, is is also possibly yeah. that one. Is five seconds of of a, of a very nice airborne shot of a charge. And that's it. Also, yeah. Waterloo. The I French understand. don't advance in column. Like, they advanced in column. The French were known for advancing in column. Obviously, from from our interviews, those are earlier. the kind of things that you could include. Yeah, from our interviews earlier, I understand filming it as a piece of film. I get it, right? But they did it in 1970, okay, and they and they did it better. And if you're going to depict Waterloo, which is the defining battle of the Polonic era, you know, there's obviously countless others, but you just just got that wrong. You just 
on the day, like you've got everything there. You've got all the men that, that's been trained up. Brilliant. You don't show the main things. You don't show Hugo Moore Farm. You don't show La Haye Saint. It, I just don't understand where you get that. And then you've got all this added nonsense about the, the Baker rifle thing and him being shot at the end. Napoleon charging in with a sword. I'm like, I know as a layman, as someone who just has a very basic understanding of Waterloo, none of this stuff happened. And I think it's a bit of an affront to, to then go, oh, well, historians, you weren't there. You, you can't say that. And I'm like, but there are people that make that dedicate their lives to knowing this. You're, you're like casting them away as if their opinion doesn't matter. It, it just very, it rankled me that, that, that everything about this end of that movie just really got on my tits. I could have forgiven a lot of stuff if the end of the movie had been like a fantastic representation of Waterloo because that's what I was expecting. The squares were nice, but then mm-hmm. after that, I just it just lost me. And, and, and as I've said earlier with my rant, I, the, the movie just didn't work for me. Well, famously, the, the, the you know the old guard was was halted on the slopes by massed musketry, um, yeah, and that wasn't shown. It just turned into a melee, and I don't even think you get yeah. a guard going in, do you? No, it's just shown as a general advance in line. I'm like that. That is the cream of the crop of Napoleon's force. Yes. Like he's sending them out to win the day, and they get beaten back by, you know, he's done plucky, it so many times before. They were know, his. His yeah. hammer. Yeah. Um, show that. You can't try and show Napoleon as this 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 love affair and then not show him as this general that he's meant to be. And I think that's what really annoyed me is I didn't get any of that from Watkins' performance. I think that's what really annoyed so, me the most. Uh, in one interview, Scott said, I don't know if he did that, aka fire at the pyramids, at the Battle of the Pyramids, which wasn't by the pyramids, by the way. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it was a fast way of saying he took Egypt. And for me, do we need a fast way of saying he took Egypt? Because why can't we just have a sequence where the Mamelukes and the Ottomans attack a Napoleonic square, a French square, and they're beaten? They don't need to fire cannons at the pyramids. And I understand that that might have been a budgetary constraint. And I understand that they probably cut the the Italian campaign, which really put Napoleon on the map in in the 1890s. There's a number of little things, like the meeting between him and Wellington. That's okay. It's a nice sequence and the fact to bookend the full thing English and to, for some reason, to bring them together. Which is fucking weird. It's just yeah, and it's nice that it was shot on the big tree and and stuff. Yeah, and, and you see the sprinklers. Oh, no, and, no, no, Matt, 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 not dreaming. It looks sprinkler. Oh, 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 talking about gaffs. There's three instances of extras looking directly at the barrel of the camera in this. Mm. Just to reiterate, I think if the film had given us some semblance of the reason why Napoleon was so feared and why he needed to be stopped in 1815. Show me a fucking map. Yeah, just to give us a... We don't... Well, okay. I'll, I'll also mention this. There's no way anyone without a, a cursory knowledge of revolutionary and Napoleonic France and the Napoleonic Wars, will be able to follow this and know what all of those early rapid yeah. little sequences are, are showing. Okay, we understand he's he's earning his spares at Toulon, but we don't see any of the Italian campaign, and then we, we, we jump to Egypt and we get a very little bit of that, and then it's political intrigue. You don't know why he's firing cannons at people at one point, and then yeah. he's trying to lead a coup and being thrown down some mm-hmm. stairs at another. We don't understand the context of that. It if, glazes if a lot of stuff. Yeah. yeah. And again, as I said earlier, it's very difficult to condense so much into this. Yeah. There's a it, there's a there's a, a series, a TV series, the French made a very high budget one uh, a number of years ago now about the revolution. And, and it does depict all of these you know elements in the, of the revolution mm. and the, the terror and all of the various attempts at governance without a monarchy um, very well. You can't condense that into a film. So perhaps if the script had been stronger and they picked their battles and picked a starting point or or found a way to, to string all of these disparate sort of situations together, it would have had a little bit more weight. It's it I think it's just a very large I'm, I'm, I am sad to say it, but I think it's a, a bit of a missed opportunity in in, it is. in terms of, of of cinema. We talk about um, 
historical inaccuracy does it mar a film and nine times out of ten we say no it doesn't if the film is well made and it's a good piece of cinema and on this occasion it isn't i just no. don't think the and the script stands up the edit stands up and yeah. the, the 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 directorial vision i've got to say it now thank you so much to paul and yes. Luis for coming on and talking to us because they they catch a lot of flack mm. Irregardless of our something. personal opinions, like thank you very yeah. much for joining us. Absolutely. I mean, we have to be true to ourselves. And there's parts of that film that I really appreciated. And I loved hearing some of the nuance that he put into the film and that Paul put into the film. But at the end of the day, we have to, you know, discuss the film as we see it. And for me, it's a bit of a missed opportunity. It is. Uh, re echo Matt there. Thanks very much for joining us, Paul. Anna, Larice, it meant a lot to us and we really hope everyone got a little bit more of appreciation how the movie was made and how some of these decisions are made and it's incredibly tough to um, do those jobs but that's what we do on the show we we like to highlight the people that work on the sets and how hard it is and you know remind everyone that you know the fact these films how these films get to the screen you know how you know when you're sitting down with your popcorn like it's a huge thing and a, and massive undertaking a massive undertaking and for me and matt this week the movie just didn't work for us but hey you might have enjoyed it that's the beauty of cinema it's a subjective medium um and uh talking about a subjective medium uh next week we embark on operation delta force december you thought the themed bumps were gone but no they're back we put ourselves through dirty dozen december was it this last christmas i think it was yep yeah, we did all the Dirty Dozen films, but this this year we have got a Christmas cracker for you all. Um, I don't I don't think they're even any way possibly linked to Christmas, but we're doing it anyway. It, because it had a D. It was Delta Force December, and it rolls off the tongue beautifully. So joining us next week for Operation Delta Force 1, uh, 1997, is the film's director, Sam Furstenberg. Um, so do look out for that one late 90s classic action um starring a ghostbuster in ernie hudson i mean amazing amazing can't wait and we can't wait um, so do please join us again for that um now mossland now is your time do the outro <laughs> thanks so much for listening everybody don't forget to tune in to our uh episode on friday where we'll have both of the interviews with paul and larice uh combined together in full um, head over to fightingonfilm.com to check out the accompanying articles for all of our blogs and you'll be able to find all of our back catalogue um, nearly 170 now I believe it is 160, getting close yeah, uh, so if you think you have the time and the stamina, please do go back and start from the beginning if this is your first episode, we have covered an awful lot of ground and we would love to hear about your progress, so again Thank you so much to our guests. Tune in on Friday for that extra episode. And thank you very much for listening. Bye, guys. Thanks for listening, folks. Bye-bye.